So, <clears throat> so good morning, uh, Donna Billings. Good to have you with us on this morning. <clears throat> we are again this morning not starting with uh, any music in the background. Uh, hopefully, we're going to uh, get this issue get this issue resolved. Um, <clears throat> but until then, I want to figure out how to use this time without actually just making it silent. <clears throat> because I know for those of you who are watching, when you come on, uh, you don't know whether your sound is working or not. So I guess I can use this as time to kind of greet everyone and um, try and interact a little bit more with you. Uh, Ricky Harper, good to have you with us on <clears throat> on this morning. And uh, the Gatewoods are with us, Brenda and Woody. Good to have you all with us on, on uh, this morning. This is July the 5th. And it is 72 degrees outside, I believe. And uh, let me make sure on that on that weather forecast. No, it's actually 70, 75 degrees on today, and our high is supposed to be uh, 97. It is a heat advisory out today because uh, having the last couple of days of the heavy rain, and then the sun is going to come out today, and it is going to come out with a with a vengeance. And so um, make sure that you hydrate as you are out in um, as you're out in the weather on today. Uh, this Arkansas weather is uh, very humid and so it doesn't take a lot to get uh, overheated. Uh, good morning, Ramonica George. Good to see you with us on this morning. Uh, Tanya Frazier, good morning. Good morning to you, J.D. Livingston. Good to see you on this morning. Uh, good morning, Brother Clint Culp. Good to have you with us on uh, this morning. Uh, Sister Vanita Morgan, God bless you. Good to see you up and going on today. Uh, praying God's blessings upon you and pray that you had a, an excellent 4th of, of July. Uh, Sister Flora Easter, good morning to you out there on the West Coast. Uh, good to see you with us on this morning. It's 424 out there in, um, uh, in California. Good morning, Sister Betty Brown. Good to see you on this morning. Uh, Pastor Samuel White, uh, we miss you on, on yesterday. <clears throat> uh, we got full of barbecue and uh, fish and desserts galore. Uh, Sister Sharon, as always, uh, she overdid with the cooking, and uh, we obliged her by overeating, especially when she had uh, all the dessert that she had available. And I'm not a real big dessert person, but when you're sitting there and you're looking at all of that chocolate cake and strawberry cake and German chocolate cake and banana pudding, it is hard to just simply say no. And uh, truthfully, I didn't say no to a whole bunch on yesterday. Uh, Curtis Norford, good to see you on uh, this morning. Deborah Davis, God bless you on this morning. Uh, Ernestine Butler, good to see you. Good morning, uh, Bobby Carey out there in Oakland, 63 degrees there in Oakland, California. Uh, spent time with our nephew yesterday uh, from Oakland. Uh, Chris had a nice conversation with him and the family. Good morning, Sister Harris. God bless you on this morning. Praise hands and loving hearts. Good to see you on uh, this morning. Sister Linda Faye Dixon, good to see you uh, on, on this morning. Praying God's blessings upon, upon you. Uh, Sister Hattie Alexander, good to see you Good to see you on uh, on this morning. Uh, good morning, Wanda James. God bless you. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, can you all see that Bobby Kerr is, is rubbing this uh, weather in? The high in Oakland today is going to be 69, where we're already like six degrees above your high today. Uh, so uh, what a difference it makes from one part of the country to the next. Uh, good morning, Deacon Hicks. God bless you on this morning. Uh, Barbara Peterson, good to see you out there in Arizona on, uh, on this morning. Uh, this is Essie Richmond, good to see you as well. Clint Culp, again, Francis uh, Hill, good to see you on this morning. Uh, Lisa Taylor, rise and shine. It is a Trust the Truth Tuesday. Amen. Good morning, Stephanie Dykes. God bless you on this morning. Uh, Donna Fleming, good to see you on this morning. Danielle Benton Young, God bless you on this morning. Uh, Brother Danny Scruggs, Sister Anitra Meeks, uh, Sister Betty Ellison, good to see you on this morning. Uh, good morning, Sister Brenda Carr. We miss you on miss you on yesterday. Uh, good to see you up and going this morning. Glad you did have groceries uh, delivered to you. Flossie Moore, good to see you this morning. Sister Joanne Reed, uh, good morning to you. Good to see you on this morning. Vicki Davis, uh, Deacon Rex Graham, good to see you on this morning. Uh, Kelsey Holmes, God bless you on uh, this morning. Sharice McGee, good to see you uh, on this morning. Uh, Kalina Graham, God bless you. Uh, Flossie Moore, this is Julia Payne, good to see you uh, as well on, on this morning. Uh, Irene Lacey, God bless you on this morning. Thank you for joining in with us. Uh, Gwen Jones out there in the capital city, uh, good morning to you. Be safe in the traffic out there in Little Rock on this morning. Brother Larry Woods, good to see you. Uh, Brother Kenny Norfolk, pray that you are doing well on today. Uh, Al Stennis, good to see you on this morning, Mira Creer. Uh, good morning, Mira Sunshine. Thank you for all of the activities that occurred um, over the past few days here in the city of El Dorado. Uh, I know that you attended a lot of them and uh, spearheaded a lot of things. Thank you for uh, trying to bring a positive, uh, positive view to others as they come into our city to visit and to uh, give a positive atmosphere for those of us who are living here in the city. So we do thank you. I think it's important to uh, let our mayor know that we do appreciate the effort that she is making. And um, I read some of the posts in El Dorado about the uh, flood that we had day before yesterday and uh, I know that everyone is calling upon the mayor to fix the streets, and I know that the mayor has said, I don't know how many times that that does not fall under the category of her office. Um, listening is not always one of those things that people do. So uh, just continue to do what you do, mayor. Good morning, Stephanie. Good to see you on this morning. Uh, Sister Annette, Tony Moody and uh, all of the rest of you who are joining in with us on this morning. All right, let's just take a moment and uh, those of you who are walking with us in um, Purpose Driven, we are, um, we are focusing this week. This is uh, week 13 or day 13 in your Purpose Driven. And we are uh, focusing on uh, Let me worship that pleases God. Uh, that is our focal point for, uh, for this week. Uh, worship that pleases God. Uh, as we are thinking about this whole idea of worship, uh, remember when we, when we talked about worship uh, a little bit ago, when we first introduced the idea, we were talking about worship as a lifestyle. Uh, it's not... Worship is not just a Sunday morning uh, community time of fellowship where we, where we gather together. Uh, that, is, uh, that is part of worship. That is part of the gathering of God's people. 
but that is not worship in its entirety. Uh, worship is a lifestyle. It is who we are. Uh, not, it, it is not just who we are, it's also what we do. And so who we are are the children of God. What we do is seek to give pleasure unto the Lord. So worship is about uh, giving pleasure to God. Everything that we do, it should be for the purpose of giving pleasure unto God. Now, when we approach God uh, in this idea of worshiping, uh, doing all things for his pleasure, we want to walk away knowing that whatever it is that we did, the activity that we performed, uh, that God was pleased with it. A smile came upon his face. Uh, remember, God is our friend. And one of the goals that we have is we are striving to give pleasure unto our friend. We want our friend to enjoy this relationship. And so what we do is uh, we try to please him. Uh, Jesus said in, uh, in the book of St. Mark, chapter 12 and verse 30, uh, Jesus tells us to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, with our soul, with our mind, and with our strength. Uh, he's saying, worship God with your all. Every aspect of who we are and every aspect of what we do, it should be a, it should be a worship experience. It is an opportunity to give pleasure unto God. So how do we do this? Uh, how, how do we do this? Well, if we're going to, to worship God in a way that's pleasing unto him as a lifestyle based upon who we are, then one of the things that we have to do is we have to learn how to worship God with uh, accuracy. Okay, we have to be accurate. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that it has to be based upon truth. When we worship God, we have to get into the word of God so that the word of God will teach us what is pleasing and what is acceptable unto the Lord. If you're going to do something that pleased me as an individual, then what you have to do is you have to come to me and find out how I feel about something. And once I tell you how I feel about it, then you can proceed into that process. But if you're trying to please me and you don't know what I like or what I dislike, then it's going to be very difficult for you to do something that brings pleasure unto me. This is why in our own personal relationships, that if you don't know the person and you're trying to please them, uh, you may accidentally do it by not knowing them, guessing, and just, you know, performing some acts, and maybe that act is going to be acceptable unto them, but it's a whole lot easier to get to know the person, to know their likes, to know their dislikes, and then to perform those actions that you know are pleasing and acceptable unto them. So as we go about uh, worshiping God, we, we must know him for who he is. Jesus says that God is looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. So that means that in order for you to worship God, you have to worship him based upon truth. Where do we get that truth? The truth comes from the word of God. God's word reveals to us the very person, the very nature uh, the very personality of God. The Bible reveals to us what God likes and what God dislikes. And so as we are going through our daily activities of worshiping God, of giving pleasure to him, we allow the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance those things that God likes. Now, when you are functioning based upon pleasing God, based upon the knowledge of what God likes, then it's going to keep your mind focused more on God and less on you. So worship again, it is about that ability to love God with your whole being 
and then take everything that you do based upon biblical revelation, you want to do that for the pleasure of God. That is your worship act, all right? Again, it's not just an event that takes place on Sundays, but it is a continuation of what occurs in the life of the believer as he lives his life based upon biblical revelation. All right, so that's so much about where we're traveling, uh, how we're applying the word of God uh, into our life. Now, let's move now to uh, our study that we're doing uh, this week. We are in Psalm 73, and this is where we're going to spend some time on this week. Uh, and by the way, those of you who missed us on, on yesterday, uh, we do understand, uh, we knew that there would be many people that um, would not be working on yesterday, but we wanted to go on and and uh, get up and spend time with those of you who were working or those of you who did get up. And so thank those of you who joined us on yesterday morning. Uh, those of you who slept in, we pray that you, um, you know, that you join in with us later in the day. All right, so we're at Psalm 73. Uh, psalm 73 is the first Psalm in this new category, this new book of uh, Psalm, book three. And um, the first 11 Psalms um, from 73 forward, uh, these 11 Psalms, <clears throat> excuse me, they are written by Asaph. Uh, Asaph is one of the uh, worship leaders. He was appointed by David uh, as a worship leader to organize the worship experience, the praise, the singing, uh, the organized worship experience for the children of Israel. I didn't say this yesterday, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's important uh, for us to focus on this because many young people are under the impression that organized worship is not a good thing, all right? They frown upon uh, organized worship. Uh, they, you know, they, they want to do, uh, they want to do an individual thing whereby, whereby they are just, you know, focusing on self. You know, I don't want to go to a building uh, that's outdated. Uh, I, I want to be able to, you know, just be free in how I worship God. I don't need a minister to preach to me, you know, I don't need a, a choir and, you know, and all of those type things. They're anti-organizational uh, worship. Well, let me just say to you that as you get into the study of the word of God, you're going to discover that number one, the Bible says all things are to be done decently <clears throat> and in order. So it is not out of order to have a structure that you follow when you are worshiping in community and Israel worshiped in community. And so they didn't want it to be chaotic. Uh, they wanted to have structure. People are under the impression that, that if you are structured, then you cannot, um, you can't worship God freely. Listen, the Holy Spirit is intelligent and he is capable of, of uh, allowing you to worship God, to be fulfilled in your worship experience, but also have structure. Uh, when you look in Genesis, God started the creation with structure. Uh, each day, he had certain things that took place in order. Uh, and so he didn't, you know, he wasn't limited because he had order and had, had laid out how he wanted things to go. God is a God of order. He is not a God of chaos. So it is okay to have order. And this is what David did uh, as he began to organize the community worship. Even in your private time with God, you ought to have a structure of, of going from point A to point B, C, D, and et cetera, uh, as you are worshiping, the God, worshiping God. Now, is there anything wrong with spontaneity? Of course it is not. It is okay. It is okay to uh, at times uh, move from, 
from the structure that you have laid out, especially if the Holy Spirit uh, moves you in a different direction. But to have a hundred, three, four, five hundred people under one roof, and then everybody doing that, which seems right in their own eyes, what you have is a description of the book of Judges. You have total, absolute chaos. So, uh, so David appoint these worship leaders. Asaph is one of them. Later on, the children of Asaph, uh, they would serve as the worship leaders uh, and this continued all the way through the captivity. And after they came out of the captivity, the sons of worship continued leading the, the praise and, and worship experience for the organized uh, worship in Israel. Well, uh, Asaph, as he is sharing with us in Psalms 73, uh, what he does is he starts out and he starts out with a personal observation. And the personal observation that he has uh, is shared with us in Psalms 70, Psalm 73. So let me just uh, go there with you. And let me move this so I can pull up that passage. Okay, in Psalm 73, uh, quickly the King James Version says, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well near slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak uh, loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and the tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither. Uh, there, therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Again, we're going to stop there at uh, verse 12, because verse 12 gives us the heart of the matter. Uh, so he opens up in verse one and he starts out by, uh, by talking about uh, his own standing, uh, where he sees himself and where he sees himself uh, in the Lord uh, is this, that God is good and he is certainly good to Israel. And then he gives a, a, a reason as to why he believes God is good to Israel because Israel has uh, a clean heart, right? Uh, so uh, they, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of clean heart. Remember I shared with you yesterday that um, uh, Israel, like us, were never worthy of the blessings that God had granted unto them. To approach God, um, it was the grace of God and not the goodness of Israel. Israel didn't deserve God's goodness, nor do any of us. Uh, and yet God is still good. And uh, so that's an important thing to remember. But then in verse two, what the writer does is he now begins to, um, he begins to talk about a problem that he has. And uh, he says here that he, he almost slips is the term uh, that he utilized. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well near slipped. What causes him, what causes the writer here to almost slip? Well, what caused him to slip was his misperception in verse one, <laughs> that God was good to Israel because Israel had, clean, had a clean heart. Uh, that misunderstanding, that, that theology or that doctrine of 
God blesses only those who are good is what caused him to slip. Uh, that misperception that when you do something good, then God has to do something good in return. It's like God is paying a debt for your goodness. And uh, that is never the case. And yet this was the perception that the writer had, that being obedient automatically is going to bring forth uh, comfortable blessings. And I, I like to say it that way, comfortable blessings, because God can bless you and yet it not be comfortable. So anyway, in the idea of the writer is that if you were, if you were righteous, then life was going to be easy. Life was going to be good. Everything you touch was going to prosper. You know, you're going to be able to speak it and it come into existence. Uh, this is the attitude that the writer had. But his experience was saying something totally different. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well near slipped. Now, why is it that I'm losing my faith is basically what he's saying here uh, in verse two. He's about to lose his faith in God's goodness, in God's sovereignty, in God's righteousness. Why is that? Watch what he says in verse three. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Listen to what he said. He says that the problem that he has is that he became envious when he saw the foolish, right? Now, when we talk about someone who's foolish, the Bible defines for us a fool. A fool is one who has said in his heart, there is no God. Now watch this. Here you have in verse one, you have the proclamation from a believer that God is good. In verse two, you have a believer questioning that faith. In verse three, you have the believer who is envious of those who don't believe in God. How do you get from a profession of the goodness of God to the point where you're almost not believing God to the point that you are even envious of those who don't even believe in God? Here's what he said in the B part of verse three. This is, this is what uh, the problem that he's having. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, he started looking at how God seemingly was blessing people who were unsaved. All right. Those who were not even trying to do what is righteous. Here he's looking at these individuals who is doing everything contrary to what God has said man should be doing. And he says, I'm looking at these individuals and here is what. I am seeing, I'm seeing them prosper. I am seeing them get all the stuff I don't have, <laughs> all right? How is it that God can be righteous? How is it that he can be all powerful? How is it that he can be all knowing, knowing what kind of people these are and knowing the stuff that they're doing and he be the God that I am told that he is, that's good. And yet he allow all of this wickedness to take place. And then on top of that, he bless those who are doing the wickedness. He bless them to prosper. He says, I don't get it. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then watch what he says here in verse four, as he, as he talks this problem through. And that's what he's gonna be doing uh, from verses four all the way down to verse 17. He's going to be examining. He's really going to be looking at, uh, looking at what he considers uh, this problem to be. <clears throat> and so as he is studying this problem, as he has his eyes uh, focused on this particular problem, the first thing that he notes here is this, watch in verse four. He says, for there are no bands in their death. Uh, the, the Hebrew word that's used here for, uh, uh, for bands, it means pain. He says, 
He says, when I have looked at the life of the wicked, what I see is him being prosperous, his business growing, his, his family is healthy. He is healthy. He's wearing fine clothes. Uh, he makes investments and he gets three and four, the returns on his investment. And then I look, I examine his life all the way through. And here's the thing that I notice that when he die, he dies in comfort. He is not, you know, he's not withering in pain. He's not screaming out in pain, confessing his sins and saying, you know, I should have trusted God. I should have lived a better life. I should have helped people. He says, I am looking at this individual who has been wicked his entire life and everything that he's touched has prospered. And now I see him lying on their deathbed and they're not in pain. They seem to be dying in comfort. I expected at least on the deathbed that they were going to be reaping all the stuff that they had sowed in life. And here they are just going to sleep just as comfortable as they want. They close their eyes with no pain whatsoever. He says, and then here's what really gets me. I've been watching this person, this wicked individual. I've been watching them my whole life, their whole life. And what I've discovered is this. They weren't getting weaker. They were just getting stronger. He says, that's not right. I got an issue with that. All right. This is what he's saying to God. I've got an issue with the fact that here you have Israel who is your child and you're blessing them because you're demanding that they be good and they are good. But then you go over here and you have these folk who are wicked and they doing everything that Israel is told not to do and they're prospering. And when they die, they're just as comfortable and they just get stronger and stronger and stronger in their life's journey. The writer says, I got issues with that. When I'm reading Psalm 73, uh, I'm reminded of the, uh, the father that had the two sons. And we know the, the prodigal son, you know, we know him and the life that he lived and <clears throat> how he took his father's goods and went out and blew it in, in a party. It ended up in the, the hog pen. You know, we know that story. We saw how he came back home and the father welcomed him with open, loving arms. We know that story. But we miss the fact that the elder son who stayed at home, he was Psalm 73 in his mindset. Because when his, when his brother, who had spent everything in, in, in terrible, wicked living, comes home, instead of being punished, he's given a fatted calf. His daddy puts a robe on him. His daddy put a ring on his finger. A party is thrown for him. And his brother says, this is not right. He should be suffering. He should not be celebrated. How can you do wrong and end up experiencing celebration? Now, some of you who are listening, you're challenged in this area because there's a part of us, there's a part of us that when we are looking, when we are doing what we believe we're supposed to be doing and we're doing it from the sincerity of our heart, and we look around and we see those who are not even trying to do what is right. And we start seeing the blessings that we say are coming into their lives. Here's a part of us that start to say, it's not fair. Why am I having to go through all this? 
Why am I going through this suffering? And yet here this individual is not even making an effort and their bankroll is much larger than mine. Their house is much bigger than mine. They're getting a promotion on the job when I'm not getting a promotion. You know, this person, they drag into work whenever they want to. They take off whenever they want to. You know, they, they're not sincere in what it is that they're doing. And they're the first ones to get promoted. I'm at church every Sunday. And here are these folk who only show up on Easter. And their life is better than mine. Their car is newer than mine. Their clothes are fancier than mine. And to be honest about it, when I look at the fact my health is failing and their health seems to be getting better. Instead of them getting weaker, they seem to be getting stronger. How is it that they can party 24 seven, drink all day and all night, smoke dope, run all this street and their lives seem to be much better than mine? He says, I don't get it. Watch what he says in verse five. He said, they're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. The wicked who is being prosperous, they're not even going through what the ordinary person is going through. You know, you got these rich individuals who don't ever worry about how they're going to pay a light bill. They don't even know what their light bills are. You know, they, th this person who's a drug dealer, who's out there, and uh, selling dope, poisoning our children, and, and uh, living high on the hog, got money stacked on top of money, and doesn't seem to have a trouble in the world. Here I am, I'm working 12 hours plus a day, and this guy doesn't even work, and he driving by, and his, his rims cost more than my whole car does. He doesn't seem to have the same kind of problems and issues that the ordinary person have. They seem to be living high above everybody else. And he says, and it irked me. He's had problems with that. My faith is wavering. You need, me, you need to give me an explanation, God, because what I'm believing and what I'm seeing is not making sense to me. Well, let me just tell you, you need to stay with Psalm 73 because the story is not over. What you're observing, there's more going on than what meets the eye. But I know right now you're like the psalmist, but I can only go by what I see. So let me just challenge you. You gotta stay in verse one. Because when you start to get in verse two downward, your feet can slip. Your faith can, your faith can start to question. Know that God knows what's going on. Let's ask his blessings this morning. Father, we come now at this time to thank you that our faith says to us that our eyes are not the final determinant, that what we see in the prosperity of the wicked is really the extension of your grace that you give unto all men, us included. We acknowledge, Lord, yes, that we have sinned and we have come short of, the, uh, of your glory, but we don't want to become proud hearted and think that we are deserving of your blessings, nor do we want to become self-righteous and start to believe that others are not deserving of your goodness. And Lord, we don't want to become so wise in our own understanding that we believe that you've got to explain to us what it is that you're doing. We want to be a people that live by faith and not by sight. We don't want to become so distracted by what's going on in the life of others that we miss what you're doing in our individual lives. But thank you for your patience and your understanding when you realize that we as your children are in the elementary part of life and you treat us with love and kindness 
even when we don't understand. We appreciate you for today and the time that you've given to each of us individually and collectively. Keep us, those who are traveling, give them traveling grace. Those who are sick, allow them to experience your healing power. The bereaved, may you comfort their hearts and we'll be mindful to give you praise, glory, and honor. In Christ's name, we ask these in all blessings. Amen, amen, and amen. Listen, you all, let me just remind you again that you are God's word manifested in the flesh. And because you are the living word that people will read on a daily basis, make sure that you're standing on solid foundation because here's what you need to know. We walk by faith and not by sight. Remember, you were left here to be a blessing, never to be a burden. Be a blessing to someone and we'll see you tomorrow morning. We'll wake up with pastor. Until then, you all be blessed. God bless you.